Housing affordability in the United States has fallen significantly since the height of the pandemic. The National Association of Realtors who put out this data, they closely watch the affordability index, which considers prices, rates, and buyer's income. Now, the way this chart works is that scores above this line, which is 100 on the housing affordability index means that homes are more affordable. We are currently sitting at 101.2, which is dramatically lower than it was just a couple short years ago in 2019. However, it is still in line with what we saw in the late 80s and early 90s. At current levels, the housing affordability index says that the median buyer can afford the median price US home, but barely. And if you go back to 2020, the median buyer could afford the home with the 70% cushion, but of course that was probably a product of 3% mortgage rates. With interest rates going up recently, my suspicion is that the affordability index is likely to go down a little bit more from where we are today. And if I'm being objective in looking at the past history here, is that housing gets significantly cheaper in one way or another once we get to 120 on this index or it gets really affordable when we're north of 160. So this will be something to pay really close attention to. Now let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit and we'll look at some Redfin data. This is for the period ending February 12th. It's key housing market takeaways for over 400 metros here in the United States. Median home price is sitting at about 347,000. That's up 1% year over year. So we did eke out a gain on a national level. However, that number is slightly deceiving because in hindsight, site, the market probably peaked out in April or May of 2022. So as we move into the spring, we're likely to see negative year over year numbers. Now, what's interesting is we have a bit of a bifurcated market. Median sales price fell in 20 out of the 50 most populous U.S. metros. The biggest drops were going to be in the California region. We saw Oakland see a decrease of 9.3% year over year. Sacramento was down 7.4%. Austin down about 7%. Phoenix down 5.5%. And Detroit down about 5 5.4%. But in some markets, we did see prices actually increase uh, pretty dramatically year over year. Prices increased most in Milwaukee at about 13.6%, West Palm Beach, Florida, 11.2%, Miami, Florida, about 10%, Columbus at 9.6%, and uh, Fort Lauderdale sitting at about 9% um, price increase year over year. Now, the average monthly mortgage payment on a median price home is sitting at about $2,400 per month. That's with a 30-year fixed at 6.32%. Now, that's actually down slightly from a couple months ago. However, from a year ago, it's up about $400. $171. Among the 50 most populous U.S. metros, pending home sales fell most in Las Vegas, coming in at almost 60% year-on-year. Austin fell about 52%. Phoenix came in about 49%, Nashville at 47.4%, Riverside, California is down 46.7%, while pending home sales rose in two metros, Chicago at 67.7%, and Cincinnati at 30% increase year on year. Housing inventory or months worth of supply still remains low. We're at about 4.1 months. This is moving into more of a neutral market. Generally speaking, anything less than three months is what we would consider a seller's market. Three to six is neutral and anything above six would be considered more of a buyer's market. So we're definitely seeing more on the market, but it's still not a dramatic enough increase to put us in full swing in a buyer's market. And then the median days on market is sitting right at about 51 days. So it's taking about two months to sell property. Now, speaking of home values, this is a really interesting illustration that Zillow puts out. This is the Zillow home value index and it shows year over year growth and it talks about the different markets that have either gained or lost value. We have some areas that are still staying strong, holding their value, even increasing. And then we have other areas that are decreasing in price when you look at the year over year numbers. So Miami, Florida actually came in at the top spot, just over 12% year on year home value growth. And then you can see uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Looks like Hartford, Richmond, Orlando, Oklahoma City, all of these areas um, gained nearly 10% year on year. Now, as we scroll down the chart, you can see some of the markets that show negative year on year growth. So San Francisco got the top spot. They were down 4.9%. Sacramento, which is actually my market, that came down about 2.59% year on year. San Jose, 2.29%. So California is getting hit really hard right now. Housing starts are down across the board. 
The red line here is gonna be one unit structures, so they're talking about single family homes, while the blue line here is gonna be two units or more. And you can see that both the multifamily space as well as single family space are down here, which is an indication that builders are feeling the squeeze and they're having to pump the brakes to realign with the current market. Now, this is only anecdotal evidence, but some of the home builders in my market are starting to have to roll out all the stops to bring buyers through the front door and close deals. They're providing things like large closing cost credits. They're helping to buy down mortgage rates. They're providing design studio credit. And in some cases, they're even having to reduce their pricing. And of course, for home builders, that's the last thing they want to do because it sets the comps for the properties that have already sold and it doesn't set a good precedence for future construction that they plan to do within that community. These blue bars are indications of when we've actually had recessions. And one thing that I noticed is that if you're looking at these housing starts, they almost always drop before or during a recession. So in a way, the housing starts falling here could be an indication that we might be going into some sort of economic contraction or recession here in 2023. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about mortgage rates a little bit. This is one of the biggest factors that impacts affordability and rates have increased in the most recent weeks. We are sitting at about 6.8% with an average 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And I found this chart here from Bloomberg. They basically surveyed investors to see what mortgage rates would do in 2023. Most investors anticipate that mortgage rates will stay above five and a half percent which of course we're well above right now. Now with the recent rise in interest rates as well as low inventory, there still is this sort of standoff between buyers and sellers. Sellers don't wanna budge on their pricing and buyers are starting to kind of back off the market again due to the affordability factor here. Mortgage delinquencies kicked up in the fourth quarter of 2022. However, they are up from a record low. So they're up slightly, but if you look at the overall trend in the average, they're still very manageable. This is still very low. It's nothing to really be concerned about at this time. And I don't know if I really see foreclosures rising drastically moving into the future here. And that's for a few reasons. Number one is that many people people still have a large amount of equity in their home. So if they absolutely needed to, they could sell the property and at least get out from under it. And the other reason is that so many homeowners are locked in at record low interest rates that I believe that they will do anything that they can to stay in that home. Even if that means renting out the entire property and moving somewhere else or renting out rooms or turning it into a short-term Airbnb, maybe even taking on another job like a to earn a part-time income or something like that, just so that they can make ends meet and pay for those properties so they don't lose it. That debt almost becomes the asset in that case, especially when you're comparing you know, what you're paying for your mortgage versus what rent will cost out there. Um, because in many markets, rents have gone up too. And the other thing that I was trying to think through is that if we went into recession and mortgage delinquencies were to rise dramatically, would the government come up with some kind of bailout or would the banks work on some sort of modification program to help people reduce their rates, lower their payments, and keep them in the home. Total household debt rose in the fourth quarter of 2022 by 2.4% or $395 billion. This is actually the largest nominal quarterly increase in 20 years. Now, one thing a subscriber mentioned to me is that this isn't adjusted for inflation. So even though this is a massive nominal number, if we were to adjust for that, these numbers might look a little less scary. But I think what's most concerning for me is that we've seen auto loans, credit cards, and student loans grow pretty dramatically. When it comes to purchasing a house, lenders look really strictly at what they call the debt to income ratio. And right now, the average car payment in the United States for a new car is about $700 per month, while the average used car payment is about $525 per month. Those monthly payments add up and they are a large claim against personal income and a potential headwind for the housing market. And the final chart that I wanna show you is an illustration of what could be a potential consumer debt trap. This shows the uh, credit card balances as well as the credit card limits that are available to uh, the average consumer here. Um, in dark blue, this is gonna be the credit card balance. And you could see that it's sitting at the highest level that it's ever been. 
Meanwhile, the Fed has been raising interest rates, which means that the cost to service these debts has gone up dramatically. The real thing that kind of scares me here is that credit card limits are sitting at record highs as well, which will of course allow them to buy what they need and what they want. As those balances rise, it's gonna become more and more costly to service those debts, especially because wages are not necessarily keeping pace with inflation. And if there's one thing that we learned in 2008 when we saw the great financial crisis is that banks and credit card companies are very quick to reduce the spending limit or the credit line that's available to consumers if they think that we're going into an economic recession. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this week's housing market review. If you found this information useful in any way, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing the content. It really helps grow and promote the channel. And we'll see you on the next video. Thank you so much.